Welcome back to Tuba People TV, where we talk about all things Arnold Jacobs all of the time. We're here in uh, Chicago, uh, and we're so honored to have Mr. Floyd Cooley uh, join us uh, to talk about Mr. Jacobs. Welcome, Floyd. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I hardly think you need really in, any introduction at all. Um, long time tubist with the San Francisco Symphony and very uh, uh, popular and uh, uh, high achieving professor of tuba at DePaul University. It's, uh, it's really great to have you. Thank you. Um, Floyd, I'm wondering uh, if uh, you can uh, recount uh, just when you first became aware of uh, Mr. Jacobs, what was that period of time that you that you first encountered him? I think it was in the winter of 1968. I was at going to school at Indiana University and uh, no, it was the winter of 1967. And I was having problems, uh, technical problems on the instrument, and, and unfortunately Mr. Bell wasn't able to really help me with them. He was a great musician and he really helped me musically, but he wasn't able to effectively address the issues I was having, and I was encouraged by a couple people to drive up to Chicago. So I borrowed a friend's really old car and barely, barely got up here, and then I found out that I got when I got here, I didn't have enough money for gas to get on, so I had to call an aunt of mine, and she loaned me 20 bucks, and I got back. But um, on that first trip, I had uh, I had a lesson on, on South Normal, yeah, in the basement where everybody else is uh, seen. Yeah. yeah. What do you remember about that first lesson? Anything? Anything? I was completely overwhelmed. Yeah. I uh, never heard a vocabulary. <laughs> like that in my life. I'd never heard uh, references to the different aspects of playing that he was he was focusing on. He always remembered that first lesson, uh, even to the last lesson that I had with him in early 1998. And uh, um, he he identified me very quickly as as an F tuba player, and uh, really. <laughs> focused on the fact that I was playing the C tuba like the F tuba. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did go away with uh, a lot of help and from that point on for the next 30 years I uh, was helplessly addicted to going back and seeing What are some of the things over the, maybe that the first first year, two, three years, uh, do you remember what he was able to, to help you with, maybe a, a little of a larger point or two that you recall? I was having some, a real problem with double vibrations, something I see all my students go through too, it was pretty common. Yeah. And um, he was able to get the hair and pressure uh, balanced out better for me. Uh, it wasn't until I got my job in San Francisco a couple years later that I really intensely studied with him. And at that point, uh, early in uh, my uh, tenure in, in San Francisco, um, there was a lot of Beethoven festivals and um, uh -huh. Beethoven weeks, Mozart weeks, the favorite weeks of all t orchestral tuba players. Yeah. And so I'd be in, I'd be in Chicago and I'd come in three, four, five times a year for a week and uh, study with him, and that's when we really got into uh, the nitty-gritty of, of my playing. And he, he didn't leave one subject untouched. It was, you know, air, articulation, study of sound, and, and that's what I, I really got from him was uh, maybe one-tenth of one percent of the understanding of sound and the study of sound and realizing the importance of what the sound quality does for us in how, how it relates to all the other aspects of playing. How did he uh, w uh, change your sound? Did, I'm assuming that he affected some sort of change in your sound uh, from before uh, you came to him to some of those lessons? Well, he he never really changed my sound. He He directed me to to play just from the sound quality alone. I, certainly at that time, which was about five years of my career, I went from playing fairly small equipment to Holden C. 
and I was uh, struggling with that at first, and, and he really helped me, and he helped me thicken out the air and, and just give the right input into the, into the instrument. But I would say that my sound concept that I started with stayed with me my whole, my whole career. Mm -hmm. He just helped me do it in a much more efficient way and uh, was able to uh, extend my career. Yeah, I, I know that uh, in talking with some students, the, when I uh, talk about thicken up the air or make the air thicker, that can be received with sometimes some quizzical looks. Um, maybe you could talk about that. What does that, what does that mean to you? What did that mean to him coming to you in terms of uh, that terminology? Well, as we all know, Mr. Jacobs had an unbelievably large toolbox. He was able to deal in uh, analogies just about as good as any teacher that I've ever heard. And um, thickening up the air was just a, a way of stimulating the brain to blow a larger quantity of air. I mean, you, you know all the the things that he he would say about about blowing. Um, we're blowing wind. We don't want the air to stick on the inside of our mouth. We want to blow from our lips. I mean, we know all those things, but he would use different ones for different people. Yeah. And I was very fortunate. I probably watched about 75 lessons uh, of him teaching other people. And what, to this day, amazes me is how, how large his toolbox was. He, um, I watched him uh, teach Michael Lynn. And both Michael and I um, had some same issues just because of all the F tuba playing. And boy, he 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 went in through the back door and a, com a completely door different door than he would use when he was talking to me. Mm -hmm. It was uh, really amazing. Yeah, that, that's something that uh, struck me as well. Just uh, how he treated everybody. He met the student where they were. He didn't try to run them through a a preconceived. Uh, 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 um, curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the curriculum was song, and mm -hmm. to the extent that you needed more help with wind to get that song, then that was the curriculum. Mm -hmm. But how he got there was always different. Yeah. With everybody, what a great, uh, what a great gift to be able to observe that many lessons with others. I was, songs. it was really fortunate because when I. When I started teaching when I was 20, and I've been teaching 36 <laughs> years, 45 years, um, I was really petrified, and I was scared of hurting the student more than helping them, and I really did not enjoy teaching maybe the first 15 years. I taught a lot, and I had success with the students, the students did well, but I never felt that confident, and it wasn't until the the year that I played with uh, Chicago, 92, 93, that I would take a lesson from Jake every week. I'd watch him two or three or four lessons each week, and then I would be teaching at DePaul. Yeah. And uh, it was an incredible circle of, of knowledge uh, that just passed from one, one point to the other student, teacher, performer. And then Jake would come about every Thursday afternoon or Friday afternoon to, to the hall, and that was the first time he ever heard me play in an orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, which was pretty amazing after all those years of, uh, of uh, San Francisco being in uh, Chicago or Jake being in, in right. San Francisco. Right. But it was a it was an amazing uh, gift to be able to watch him teach, and once I started watching him, I realized I wasn't doing so badly. <laughs> he gave me a lot of confidence that if, had I not been exposed to that, I'd probably be still shaking in my boots so I'm going to destroy somebody. That's great. Thanks. Floyd, what a, what a great, as I mentioned, a great opportunity, great gift to watch him teach so many lessons. I mean, was there anything in particular that uh, stands out or subject matter? Well, it, I think it was mostly his method. I mean, he had a great message, obviously. But he had the gift of um, going in the back door, being always called the greatest psych out teacher there was. 
And I, I tended to be fairly analytical. And uh, one, one summer, um, I was visiting my parents in Iowa. And uh, I said, Dad, can I borrow the car? I'm going to drive into Chicago and take a lesson from Jake. He says, well, I'll fly in. He was a private pilot. And we landed over here at Mixed Field and took a taxi. And my dad got to go to the lesson in the car. He was like, you know, pig and shit. It's like great. He's nice. a, he was a tuba player, very amateur tuba player. And he got to watch watch this whole session. And, and Jake started talking to Dad at the end of the lesson and said, what do you do, Mr. Cooley? He says, I'm, I'm a building contractor. I build houses, cabinetry. Wonderful. Well, <laughs> the next lesson I came back to Jake, he said, you know, you're, you're trying to, make music like your father builds a house. And I said, well, really? You know, he, he said, your father builds a house one stick at a time. And it seems like you're doing that on the tuba. And it, it really made a huge impression. For me, one of the, the, the biggest challenges and the thing that a teacher has to, to deal with in teaching is not how to teach but what they see before they teach. And at DePaul and at Manor School in New York, where I'm also teaching, I teach a class that's basically, I teach performers to teach one-on-one. -on -one. And it's a class of observation. And this is what Mr. Jacobs really, really excelled at, was observing the situation very quickly and, and then going to work but with younger teachers, it's usually, there is such a, an urge, a need to start teaching before the situation is properly appraised. Mm -hmm. And this is, was, to me, his great skill. And this is why I always felt that he was uh, a great psych out teacher. And if, if you look at those books in my studio, I mean, the third of them are on psychology. And it, it, it makes such a huge difference. And one of the, the real drawbacks of all of us uh, being one-on-one -on -one teachers is we are never taught to do it. Mm -hmm. We all learn by the seat of our pants. And that's one of the reasons why I was not feeling all that secure in my teaching in the, in the early years, because the only reason people wanted to study with me is I got this job in San Francisco. So a couple weeks later, I got a call. And I said, why do you want to study with me? I, I don't teach. And <laughs> they said, well, can I come and you can play for me or something, you know? So yes, in those early years, I was not very verbal. And I did it by, by imitation, which is a great way to teach. Yeah. But um, it didn't really develop my teaching skills. And so the reason that I'm teaching this class at the Paul and Manus is because I feel there's a huge need to get our teachers up and running much, much quicker. Um, and I run into so many, so many issues that um, in students coming to me that have previously studied that um, their needs weren't really addressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, observation is where it's at. So with my students in the class, it's 80% observation and 20% teaching, and all these students in the class are from the entire school. They could be a xylophonist, they could be a singer, they could be a pianist, they could be a brass player. But I'm teaching them to teach any instrument based upon hmm. observation and their knowledge of music, not necessarily their, their knowledge of how the other instruments work, what yeah. their technique is. And, um, it's been very successful. It's too successful. Um, Julie DeRoche, who's head of the performance department at, at DePaul, now requires all woodwind students to take the class. Wow. <laughs> so that's yeah. very busy. You know, I have a hard time remembering names, you know, maybe more than two at a time, you know. And I think uh, this winter quarter, I'm going to have 25 people in there. And it's, it's a very intense class where they have to teach uh, in front of me. They have to get a student. They have to observe other teachers and this is what's so great is that's what I got from watching Jake was being able to serve 
observe a great teacher. Mm -hmm. So I require all the students to do 15 hours of observation of DePaul or any other teacher, mm -hmm. faculty, and write a report on it and get back to me and, and show me what they've done. It seems like, I, mean, I remember Jake uh, talking about that first lesson was often, time, often for him. That first lesson with a student was, was often for him and, and uh, um, just assessing uh, what kind of communication style, what kind of uh, background the student had, um, what he thought not only were maybe perhaps the issues, but also what was going to be an effective communication style from him to the student so, so he could meet that student. Mm -hmm. uh, where they were, rather than communicating in a way that was not received by the student, which made the communication ineffective. Mm -hmm. I, I always thought that was very, uh, uh, well, brilliant on his part, uh, very, mm -hmm. very effective. That, that was part of his, yeah. his cachet, was, was being able to uh, be such a good communicator. Not only the diagnostic abilities and then the remedy abilities, but also just the, the conduit inf of information. Mm -hmm. So I, bravo for doing that oh. at DePaul and Manus. That's that's really good. Because you're right. I mean, we if you're a tuba player and you show up in an orchestra, people start calling you, and they want to study with you because well, you're in the orchestra. You must be really good. And, but just because you can play well doesn't mean you can necessarily right. teach well. Yeah, it is a rare combination, and of course that's what Mr. Jacobs embodied was a great musician, performer, and a great teacher, and, and it's such a, a rare thing to find that. And as performers, um, this may sound controversial, but we are the teachers. The people come to study with a performer. Mm -hmm. They don't go to study with a music educator. Music education is a completely different thing. I have music education students in my class. But it's it's a whole different ballgame, and to really be a good one-on-one -on -one teacher, it, it takes a completely different uh, psychological makeup, uh, ability to assess a situation, and to directly speak to one student to sit in the classroom. Yeah, and um, this uh, this makes a really big difference in the in the uh, result of of the teaching, and with Jake being able to be that great performer, that great musician, the great teacher, he set an example for me. My, my musical goals on tuba was to be a, a really good orchestral player, to be a really good soloist, and to be a good teacher. And uh, I didn't have that goal as far as the teaching until halfway through my, through my playing career, but I really realized um, I've been given great gifts in my life. I've had great teachers. Mr. Jacobs, Mr. Uh, Bell, and before that I had a vocal teacher who was out of this world, who's uh, still living, just signed a couple months ago, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he really gave me the gift of wanting to be a musician. Uh, there were lots of musicians in my family, all uh, amateurs, but my voice teacher really encouraged me, and uh, I found singing just too difficult, mm -hmm. and so I went with the two of them. <laughs> and we're glad you did. Oh. For like during those, those uh, almost 30 years of uh, taking lessons with, with Mr. Jacobs, did you notice any, uh, any shift in his pedagogical approach? Was there any difference or was it pretty much the same? Well, as I said before, it's it, being the student and trying to take in everything he had to say to me. I couldn't really analyze what was going on until maybe after the lesson. Yeah. Um, but I did notice a real difference when I went home uh, in the fall of 93 after playing a year with Chicago that um, I had become in, a, in midlife, I had uh, really developed uh, into a, a completely different level. And during that year that I was studying with him almost every week, uh, it was, I was so intent on getting every drop of juice out of him, I could, I couldn't really, really follow what he was doing. But the way I discovered that 
changes were taking place was he, he uh, Mr. Jacobs played his cards very close, his information, his message. But he invited me, he allowed me to share specific students with him. Students who would come to Chicago to study with him, and there were things that he didn't want to deal with. And he, he preferred to deal with the larger tuba and more of an orchestral uh, approach. And he, if, if these students were coming in and they were playing F2, he'd say, Floyd, would you uh, give us a little, a little lesson? You know, I go, I don't want to do it. But what I did learn from him was how specific he could be when it came to teaching tuba. Now, when I would watch him teach, an oboe player or a, a young man from University of Michigan who had a collapsed lung, tuba player. Um, it was a, a completely, completely different approach. But I wish I could give you a, a real cut and dried answer of how his te his approach developed over the years. But I can't. All I can say is he got to know me intimately, mm -hmm. and. I would say, if I just heard the sound of his voice, things change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. Neural pathways going to work. Just, yeah. <laughs> just the sound of his voice. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, in that, that, that uh, where you were the uh, sub sabbatical substitute for Mr. Percorny, that 92-93 with Chicago Symphony, Mr. Herseth was still playing that. Do you have any, uh, any memories of that? Anything particularly attractive? Uh, oh, there were some wonderful memories uh, with him. Uh, I'd, I'd met Mr. Herseth over the years, but never really spent any time with him. And we were doing Bartok Concerto for orchestra very early on in the season. And so I thought, well, maybe a way to get to know him a little better and, and let him know that I had a, a similar interest in high quality. I said, could we play through the... Um, the movement of the uh, uh, Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, the one that's the duples, where the it's just the trumpets and tuba and I guess horns. And we played through it, and he said, "You know, nobody's ever asked me to play with them." You know, and I, I, I said, "I'm sorry. I hope I didn't offend you." But we went on to to develop a really great relationship, but it wasn't around music. It was around food and drink. And we were heading to Europe on a tour that included Spain, and he, he tipped me off to a book of James Mishner's uh, Iberia. And he and a couple other uh, players from the CSO and myself, we took off early, a day, on a, a day early on a plane uh, before the orchestra left. And we sat together, and I just read the book, and we were talking through it. And I was thinking back about that time last night when I sat down with my wife to a dinner of lamb chops. <laughs> and he, he Mr. Herthus, always said that his favorite meal in the world were lamb chops with mustard and rosemary. And that's what we had last night. But it wasn't planned out that way, and I wasn't expecting this eulogy to him yesterday. I, I wasn't really thinking about the thing at all. But he um, he made such a huge impression on me. And what what amazed me was at that point in his life, um, he was just just so calm about everything. He had gotten over being a, a young um, a young stallion on principal trumpet, and it was, it was really heartwarming. I, uh, a number of years after that, I, I belonged to a club in San Francisco, and it was called, called the Bohemian Club, and it originally was a club of uh, artists, writers, musicians. Now it a, has a much broader membership, it's about 140 years old, but we have a summer retreat every year in 3,000 acres of redwood forest, and, and we put on original musical productions, we bring in well-known uh, musicians, we have a band, orchestra, chorus, a tuba quartet, which uh, 
I no longer play in, but um, it was probably one of the most popular groups in the in in the club. And uh, a friend of mine and I brought Mr. Hersa to the Grove, oh, wow. and um, it was obviously at the end of his playing career, but he still had that virtuosic approach. And the great joy I had was I was the sire or the MC for this show, mm -hmm. and also got to conduct with him playing. And of course, I can't conduct. But I was just kind of stand, standing there and let him conduct from the trumpet. But yesterday in uh, the uh, CSO Brass Concert at Orchestra Hall, in this wonderful eulogy to to uh, Mr. Hersa, it, it identified him first as a husband, a father, musician, and the end was a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And he told great stories. And when we had him at the Bohemian Grove that summer, he sat down on a bench and uh, he sat there probably six, eight hours a day. And all the loyalists would come in and sit down and he would hold court. It was, it was a great moment. And it wasn't very long after he came back to Chicago, he called and said, can I come back again? Oh. <laughs> yeah, he really, he really loved it. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, but what a... That's a great story. Wow. Well, um, Puddles was so excited to finally get to meet you. Um, uh, just all the stories that I've told him about you. And of course, uh, just for me personally, uh, definitely you were in the mix uh, in, my, in my younger days with your wonderful artistry with the San Francisco Symphony and, and your uh, solo recordings released on the Crystal label. Uh, wonderful. Thank you for those. Those uh, the contributions, those uh, those storytelling moments <laughs> in sound. Um, as always, Puddles would like me to present you with uh, uh, our token of our thanks for your being here with us, with a, a container filled with genuine University of Oregon duck malted balls. So we hope that you'll enjoy this. Uh, well, thank you. Memory of our time. Thank together. you very much. And I'll be sure to have this with the next. Uh, uh, duck breast that I eat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Floyd. You're welcome. And now back to you. <laughs>